There you are. Okay, great. So now it is recording to the cloud. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about discussions. And um, I think, did we also say we'd touch on journals as well? Yes. Um, in this um, brief session. So, you we'll know, we'll save that to last yeah. because journals are discussions in groups and groups of one. It is one area where the tool is perhaps a little more limited than Blackboard. And the same is true with, um, with the other, we, we were, um, with blogs. With there blogs, is no yeah. blogging tool in Brightspace. So if we want, if people want to use it, there are other options, but it's not available in Brightspace. So. Yeah, so we're going to focus on discussion boards, you know, and we'll, we'll just briefly touch on journals um, when we're finished. So um, John right now is in one of his fall courses. So if you haven't logged in to um, D2L, I think most people are continuing on from an earlier session. So you're probably there, but um, you can go to oswego.edu forward slash my learning, or you can follow this link um, on our screen here. Just the beginning part, the mylearning.suny.edu. They both take you to the same places. You authenticate using your SUNY Oswego net ID and password. Um, so then, you know, once once you get in there, um, it'll give you options of which courses you want to jump into. So jump into one of your courses, um, and we're going to go into that top menu, course tools, into course admin. So we've been in this um, page quite a few times because you can access everything in Brightspace through this page. So um, we're going to go down to assessment, sorry, communication, um, and uh, select discussions. Eventually, it will respond. <laughs> it will load. It's probably responding faster for you off campus. They do not want us to discuss discussions. <laughs> um, well, while we're waiting for this to load, um, one of the things we should note is that the discussion works very similar to Blackboard, except there are a few differences in the structure. Um, what we normally thought of as discussion forums in Blackboard are, are um, referred, okay, there we go, um, are referred to as topics. And forums are categories of buckets that the topics fit into. Now, there's two common practices. One is you could create a forum and then a topic of the same name that's in that, which is probably not the most efficient way to go. Um, what, is, what more people seem to be doing and what, what I've chosen to done in my class is I've got two weekly discussion forums and I created a forum for each of those and then assigned a weekly topic within those. And it provides a somewhat cleaner organization. You may wanna have, for example, a, discussion forum where students are participating each week, but you might also want to have a Q&A discussion forum, or you might want to have a content sharing discussion forum. So you would create for each category a forum. So let's, let's start with that. So we're going to go to new forum here and create a um, discussion forum. Yeah, so think of forums as a category of discussions, right? Um, a category of topics. Um, so, you know, John does a lot of met metacognitive cafe um, types of uh, responses or discussion posts. Um, and so, you know, he would probably create a forum called metacognitive cafe. We can do that. Um, so um, we'll add that, you know, this could be a Q&A that you have. Um, you know, carry on from um, throughout the course, um, and it could just be general discussions. Too. Now, if it's a one-off or you want to create a different forum for each discussion for each topic, mm -hmm. you could check this box and it would automatically do that, but let's not do that. Let's leave it like this, and all you have to do at this point is make some, um, some decisions about what you want to allow. And if you do it for the forum, that will be inherited by all the topics within that. Another possibility is you could do, for example, um, you could allow students to have a choice of topics that they're going to discuss. And you could have, for example, a module one discussion forum could be a first week discussion forum. And then you could have separate topics and let cho students choose 
which topic they wish to, um, to participate in, which would certainly be consistent with UDL principles. But let's say we're going to do a weekly metacognitive cafe. If you probably, if you're going to assess the work, you probably don't want to allow anonymous posts. But if you want to get feedback from students periodically, you could have a feedback thing. Um, what I normally do is I check this next box, which is to require that students start a thread before they can reply. That's equivalent to the post first in Blackboard. And what happened, what I, the reason why I started doing this years ago is one thing I always noted is that when students could see what other people have written, they'll write exactly the same things. Um, and I noticed this when I was teaching a class of about 400 students and I broke them up into groups of 20. So I had 20 different groups within the class with the same topic they were discussing. And when I went through and looked at all those forums, what would happen is whichever student, whoever posted first in a given discussion forum, set the tone for everybody else's. If someone, if it was someone who was just really involved in the class, engaged and really conscientious, they might write four or five paragraphs. And then everyone else would write four or five paragraphs. If the student perhaps did not have the same sort of expectations and wrote a sentence or two, most of the next post would be a sentence or two. So there was this tremendous variation across uh, sessions, uh, sections, and that persisted throughout the semester. So by using a post first thing, it, adds, it does add a little bit of uncertainty for students, but the uncertainty is such that it encourages them to put more effort and more of their own thoughts into it. And we don't get the sort of cookie cutter posts because there's a much greater variety of initial posts when you ask students to respond on some topic if they're not being primed by what they've already seen. So I'd encourage that. It's mm -hmm. not a new feature, but it's really useful. Yeah. Um, you know, I would not encourage you to approve each post. You've got to, you'd have to be constantly modifying yeah, it. Especially, yeah, if you're not going to be, um, you know, moder moderating the discussion posts every day or a few times hourly. a day, <laughs> hourly, um, you know, that option is probably not for you. Um, you can also display forum description and topics. So, you know, if you have a general description, you know, this is a metacognitive, you know, cafe. Um, there is a general description that John probably includes in, in this type of forum. And so that would then be copied to each topic. So they would have, you know, a general idea of what, um, you know, what each of these, um, you know, um, what each of these uh, will be. And also you can specify the expectations that if you want them to post you know, a certain number of words, or if you want them to pose once and reply twice, which is mm. which is so standard, it's maybe not optimal, but it's what so many of us do. I do it too. Um, specify all that. Tell them what you expect. You know, and also if you want them to post at least once by a certain day, put that in the description here, mm. so that I ask them to have the first post by Friday at midnight, and then reply posts have to be completed by Sunday at midnight, just to space out the things so that students don't have to wait for someone else to post something before they have something to respond to. Um, so it keeps it very consistent um, because again, that description is gonna be copied over to every topic within that forum. And you could also motivate, I, I say, you know, you're doing these because it's been shown that, um, that thinking about how you learn and reflecting on your learning is helpful in increasing your ability to learn it, so forth. Um, and you only have to do that once and it's just picked up by everything. So now we've saved it. Now there was the option of saving and creating a topic, but we'll do that separately. So the next thing to do is you create a new topic. And the topic then has to be specified by a discuss to which forum. In this case, it's gonna be really easy. I guess there's a default just introductions form, which is good, but let's do a metacognitive cafe one here. And this would be, um, let's say, um, meta well, metacognitive cafe yeah. one or something. Module one. And normally would do is say, uh, let's say, um, well, normally I ask them to reflect on if they've had any previous online courses, what worked well, what didn't. But let's let's say um, 
let's just say, uh, expectations, what they're expecting to get out of the course or what concerns they expect to have and so forth. And then you would go in and you would put in your descriptions here and you've got all the same tools you have for anything else. You can embed videos, you could have, one thing I'll often ask them to do is watch a short video and then respond or listen to a podcast or read some document. You can put all that in there. And then these things actually are exactly the same, but whatever you specified in the, in the category or in the forum is inherited. So you don't have to reset it each time, which makes it a whole lot easier and also more consistent. Um, and then you could let people rate posts. And what I do is I allow students to upvote. Up so it's sort of like the like option in yeah. Instagram, you know, rather than having someone give someone else a one star post or something similar up or yeah. down voting. It's more positive to allow students to upvote as opposed to also downvoting um, responses. And so it's a it's a nice option. Um, and students are going to, you know, for many of our students who are familiar with social media, they're going to be very um, they're, they're going to recognize this option here pretty um, easily. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, can you prevent students from seeing a particular post? Oh, right. Um, I think we kind of addressed that with that post first option in the So, forum. well, yeah, except more generally, once it's posted, anyone else can see it unless you delete the post. And, you know, I, it's been a long time, probably seven or eight years since, in my class at least, I know that's not true in all of them, where there have been posts that I want students to take down. In fact, I think the, the last time I deleted a student's post was about six or seven years ago when they posted that they had just joined Chegg and it was a really good place to upload questions to get responses really quickly. Um, and if you did it through her account, she get a discount on her okay. use of Chegg. Um, so that one I took down pretty quickly and had a chat with her about you know academic integrity and suggesting that maybe she didn't want to be failing the course and so forth. So, um, but. <laughs> I haven't had that, but if you're in a class where there's really sensitive issues being discussed, you might want to do that, or you might want to have moderation, but it's a lot more work and it does require that you're constantly doing it so that students don't have to wait a long time for their post to appear. Right. Um, but I think we have the ability to delete posts. Scroll up. Oh, okay, yeah, um, yeah. We should look at all those things. Um, here, you could do it for groups if you define groups. And in fact, getting it way ahead of ourselves, if you wanna do journals, you define a group consisting of one person in each group, you choose a group or section topic, you create it once and it automatically is distributed to all the groups, which is so much cleaner and easier than Blackboard. So restrictions, um, this would be how you would set it up to make it available. Um, you could hide it from users, in which case they won't see it at all, or you could put in starting and end dates. And I normally just, I've been using just this, where I'll put in the date when the module opens and the time when the module opens, and I let it be visible with access restricted before the part. So if they go to the list of discussions, I'll see it, they just won't be able to post it on it until then, and it will tell them when it's available. Um, and similarly, you may choose to leave discussions open. I don't, but many people do. So for the students who are struggling or lagging behind or who were in the hospital or got stuck in travel or, or were away somewhere, or, you know, if they're in the military, they're reassigned, you may want to, um, you know, allow people to submit after, in which case, um, you know, you wouldn't choose the end date. You just let them to continue, and then you'd see it show up in your evaluation list, and you could go back. Um, so once you, but let's say we want to start this today, uh, right now, or a minute. Well, actually, we probably should do it like give it a, a minute or so, um, and we're going to have an end date, let's say of uh, next week, uh, and we'll leave it visible with access risk. They can still go back and look at it. They can't just post more, or you could hide it if you want, but I don't see any reason generally to do that. Or you can you can have it visible, but just they can't submit after that particular day. Actually, the, um, that's yeah, probably this is the, what I do. Yeah, that's the option yeah. you probably want. So they can go back exactly. and view it, but um, not submit. And um, that's how I, I've left it. And 
Yeah. And so there's an option to display in the calendar, which is a really nice option. Anytime Use you it. have, <laughs> yeah, anytime you have, um, you're assigning a date to an assignment or, you know, material. Um, in this case, we're talking about discussion posts. Um, they, anytime a date comes into play, it gives you an option to display in calendar. And that keeps everything um, very organized for students. They can go to their calendar and see all of that. So definitely, definitely use that. That that can be a really good tool for students. And they get reminders too of that right when they log into the course that the, the due date for this is approaching. And yeah. that's really helpful. Yeah. Now, we're not going to talk about release conditions here. We right. will in another section sometime in the distant future, like tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow or Wednesday. Or yeah. <laughs> but you could choose to have this open up. For example, if you wanted to have them do a reading first, you could have an item where they do the reading. And then once the, they completed the reading, it releases this. Or you could require them to get a minimum score on some test on some content and let them redo it until they do. And then it will release the discussions. Or you could do it once they've completed the last module, if you want to build something that's more self-paced. There's lots of options, but we'll save that for later. So we'll skip over that for now. And we could restrict it if you only want a subgroup to do it. Um, and then we'll go back up to the next topic and we'll choose assessment. And with assessment, this is how it shows up in the grade book. It doesn't mm -hmm. automatically do that. So what you need to do is choose a grade item. And these were things I had from my past class because this was an earlier one. So let's say this was a class with 400 students in it. So I probably don't, I didn't have a discussion form. I had to drop that. But let's say we wanna create a new grade item and let's call it um, here. The general category would be discussion. Um, and the short name, or let's say discussion one, and the short name will be clever and type discussion one, uh, but you could put the name of the discussion, whatever. Um, and then you can choose which category it goes in. Um, see here, these were the category you'd have, to, well, let's say pack back discussions. I was using pack back, we'll throw it in there and I'll get rid of that before the class opens. You could put in a description of this here um, and then the maximum number of points which would be tied to however you're grading it. Well, you have options of giving bonus. You could either include it in the overall grade calculations. Normally you would want it as part of the grade calculation, mm -hmm. so you would not check that. And um, you could use either a percentage or a point-based scheme. Or um, some of our friends at other campuses have created their own. Um, this is Judy Littlejohns at SUNY Geneseo. Um, this is Suffolk's campus default grade scheme. I might be, well, I'm not sure who did that one, but um, in any case, you could create your own. When an instructional designer does it, it then becomes part of the scheme or available for everyone. We'll just leave the default as this. You can create your own. Uh, and then you generally don't need to set the availability of this. This is when it shows up in the grade book. Mm -hmm. You probably would just let it show up when it's done. And then um, you don't need to display this in calendar yeah. because the item due dates itself are. Uh, and then click save. And now it is going to be there. Now, if you want to tie it to learning objectives, you can do that. But that requires that they be somehow configured uh, with that. And um, yeah. But here, OK, I'm sorry. I take that back. This is where you would add any rubric. We talked about that in the last section. If there are no rubrics in this class yet, second. I don't think. Yeah. Well, but if you, you know, you can create a new no. rubric in a new window, you know, right from here. So, you know, what's nice about the way this is set up is that, you know, when there are options that are contingent on the existence of a rubric, right, it'll allow you to create the rubric in a new window so that you can then go back to that page, add the rubric, you know, as, as needed, right? Um, so, you know, and same with that grade item. If you want it linked right into the grade book, it gives you the option to go into a new window, create that item so you can link it, um, you know, right there. So, um, you know, it really, it's, it's, it's signaling to you as you're creating this discussion post, all of the other things you want to consider, um, you know, having attached to this um, particular um, activity. So we've just created one and ignore this for now, but basically once you've done that, you'd make it visible to students and you would close. And now we created one. This is a really simple one, which I would not recommend. So we'll go, because but, um, we did this in a new window, we could go back to that 
um, can, that topic. Did we do it then, in a new window? Yep, it was a new window. Okay, there so we go. go back to that okay. topic. Now you can add the rubric um, that we've just created, right? Um, so you'll just want to click on the box. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that will, you know, one more time give um, you the option to print the rubric. You know, you can upload it in a different. Yeah, um, except format. this, I need to go back because yeah. this is. Oh, yeah, there you are. There we are. Perfect. Okay. And like close it. Close. It's being covered. There we go. So add, add selected. selected. And then and there you are. You have a rubric now associated with this discussion post. So and those are all the things you need to do, save and close. And then um, the only other thing you need to do is add it to your course activities. Yeah, so, you know, we'll just, um, oh, you yeah, know, score out of points. 10, you know, just um, save and close. In yes, there. thank you. Yeah. And of how you would create it. The only other thing you need to do, but let's look at the comments here first. The availability options. Um, yeah, so the availability option um, exists when you create the forum and it exists when you create each um, individual topic as well. So yeah, that's the first question. The second is, what do you do about the first post by a certain date and response by a certain date? I have those as separate rubric categories. So in the rubric, they get different points based on whether they meet those criteria. So they get more points if they if they do spread out the posts and if they do if they they get full credit on those categories i call it spacing of participation if they get everything done by the due dates if they they wait until the last minute they lose a bit not a lot but a bit it yeah. the, doesn't take yeah, much of a in note. the calendar it's only going to show you know that final date or you know if you're if you're putting a due well, date it's going to show the final date if you're putting in an availability date it'll show when it's available and if there's an end date um, it'll show that end too. date it'll show the end date as well as long as you're clicking that but it's not going to give you options of like two different due dates within the um, calendar, right, within one topic. So you could, right? Um, yeah, the main thing that would go into the calendar, I believe, is the due date. The others would show, affect the availability, but I don't think they go into the calendar. I may be wrong. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, if... Uh, it, it does give you an option to um, grade individual posts, right? I don't think it gives you an option to show due dates for individual posts, though. But if you have that in the rubric, when students enter the discussion forum, they could look at the rubric. If you, you can also put it in your course overview documents, you could build it into your syllabus. And you could even put it right in the folder where they first do the discussion right. just to remind them of that. And once you create it, you could choose print, print to a PDF, mm -hmm. upload it, and it creates a nice accessible PDF that students could then see and so forth. Yeah, so another option, I don't know if it would really be the best way to go about it, but you could create, um, you could create a separate grade column for a like post response, right? Um, and not have that, you know, directly linked to the discussion because you won't be able to link, you know, more than, um, or you won't be able to assign two uh, due dates for each topic, right? So you could create a separate grade column if you wanted, but I, I don't know if that would be the easiest for you to have two separate, um, you know, things to go through each week. Um, so it's- But you could create a category for week one or week two discussions, right. have multiple topics, again, to give, right. if you wanna let students talk about one of three different topics, you can do that and then have the score for that category be the maximum of the scores for sure. those. And that way it would only bring that in. Now, there's a question from Dennis about whether the discussion from Blackboard is retrofitted into the Brightspace forum topic hierarchy? Yes, it will come in. I, my recollection is it will come in with a forum and a topic being the same for each topic. I'm, I'm To be honest, I'm not sure because I completely re redid those just to match it because I, I actually really like the way it organizes them because when I wanna look at them, I can click only one or the other, go through and edit them and 
it's just really nice and clean, but it will put over essentially perfectly from my, in my experience, at least from Blackboard. But I, I'm pretty sure the forums and topics will have the same name, right. um, which is fine, you know, and, and that is one of the ways in which many people use the, the forum and topics. What I like about it is if you're doing multiple discussions with different directions for students, you know, having putting them all in one place and then you only put in the information specific to that discussion topic makes it a whole lot easier for me, at least, mm -hmm. to maintain that consistent look and feel. Yeah. If you have any questions, because we, we really would like to, you know, can create um, some time for you to work through and create a discussion forum and topic on your own. And so if you have any questions, if you wanna share your screen and let us know what you're working through or any um, issues that have come up, we would love to see what you're working on. We'll stop the share. Um, when you grade them, there's a quick, oops, there's a quick eval. How does a grading, interface in D2L for discussions compared to Blackboard, it's really, really similar. Um, I can show you what the general interface is, I think, without looking at the actual work of students, I think. Oh, we um, can also show what that rubric looks like on the rubric. Well, yeah, let, the, let's go the over to, um, yeah, let's go to, actually, we could use the slides from yeah, before. That's what I was thinking. Uh, let's do that. Let me call up, um, let me go to the screen. Well, let me find the slides because uh, I think, here we go. Um, and while we're waiting for this to load, we will be here first, we'll share the screen and then the slide should open any day now. Here we go, okay. So, we're going to jump ahead. This is actually something I did as a screenshot from the grading screen this morning. When you open the grading tool within it using the quick eval tool, which is how grading is often done, it will look something like this. The left side where it says grading, that will be a list of each student's discussion posts for that discussion. So you'll see it all in order just as you do in Blackboard. And then on the right, if you have a rubric, it will show up here and all you do is you click on that little arrow there, that little triangle. And then when you do that, it will open up to something like this. And this is where I have that spacing of criteria and you scroll down and it's really nice and intuitive. It'll, it's right to the side. You can see the students work, you can see that. When you hover over a box, it will display the criteria. So if you forget what was a four or three or a two or a one in terms of the description, it'll pop, it'll show up as a hover text. And then you just click on it, it will block that. You go down to the next aspect and it's really, really easy. And you don't have to click everything like four or five times as you do in Blackboard. You just click all of them, then you click submit and it will go right into the gradebook. And it's so much easier and more efficient than Blackboard ever was. Because if you remember in Blackboard, you had to click OK, and then you had to click Submit, and then you had to click OK, and then you had to click Submit, and then it right. would upload it. This does it all together. And you do have option of adding feedback for any one question or overall, yeah. just as you do in Blackboard. Yeah, so that's what the, the grading scheme will look like um, when you do assign a rubric to a discussion topic. Any other questions? We'd like you to actually play with it a little bit, try it, and then if you have questions, bring it back. Yeah. But in the meanwhile. Yeah. All of my discussions came over really nicely from Blackboard. The only issue was they look ugly like they do in Blackboard. You want to reformat them to use the same type of format options or to use something that matches the style of the other pages, just cleaning them up a little bit. This is our D2L mousse. I don't know, where did you get it from? I got that from the Brightspace people at um, CIT here on campus last Thursday. 
The little Wednesday. stuffed animal. That's better swag than I got. So try it and we'll, we'll be here to answer any questions. You can either pop them in chat or just say something and we'll try to answer them. The main thing is just getting used to that. The only thing that's really different is getting used to that forum as being a bucket like assignments or quizzes or something similar, while the topics are what we used to call forums. Well, maybe how you would add it into like a module. Okay, I suppose we've shown how to create this, so keep playing, keep working on it, but let's, let's talk about how you would then add it to a course module. So we will go back, we'll share the screen, um, and let's get out of here. back into a different um, window. Here we go. So let's say we wanted to add a discussion. We created this discussion forum. We're going to go into, actually, um, there's a few ways of doing it. One of the easiest ways is to do it right here. We can go to Course Builder, which is a tool that we've mentioned before. You use for pretty much everything. And since we've already, let's say we want to add this right into um, I'll have to remember to get rid of it. Well, let's stick it in one of the late ones so it'll be less likely that I'll forget and open the course without that. Um, you can just go right to discussions here. And right now we can look at all the forums, or in this case, it'll be the Metacognitive Cafe one. Um, and apply. we click apply, and then we, will, we should see, there we go. Uh, it's right here. We can uh, either click on it, or I think we can just drag it right over to the place where we want it. Let's say we're gonna stick it in module 14. And now if we go into module 14, it is now there. And it's at the bottom. And so you can rearrange and drag and drop it. So if you want it above the pack back discussion model. Yeah, those will be going to, away. But, right, so um, you know, if you wanna, wherever you wanna drag and drop it is, you know, um, to your needs. That's just one way, you know, you can add, your discussion uh, forum and topic, we just deleted it. Um, so well, we deleted the pack. Oh, you deleted it. <laughs> <Go on. laughs> um, you know, so, um, you know, you can also, you know, add it, um, you know, through the content um, page as well, but really using this course builder helps you um, manage the order of, of every um, web or, you know, page. Um, within in, in module within uh, your course. So it, it makes it um, really easy to see kind of your course as a whole and, and where that all fits in. And if you're going to release a module every week, let's say, and not have it all open when the course releases, one thing you might consider doing, and this is something I'm doing in my summer course, is drag up the last module and put it right at the very top after your introductory stuff. In other words, put it all in reverse order. And then what will happen is the most, as it releases, the most recent, well, I can show it in my course, um, my current course. Let's go over to, um, to here. And I'll, just to show the, how the order can work. Um, I've, I'm, I've been doing it as I've been rebuilding it, but this is my summer course, which is now in its third week. And um, when I go here, you notice week three started this morning. That shows up first because from a student perspective, it might be more convenient to have the current module right at the top of it. And each module, if we weren't here before, just shows up as one of these boxes. Um, and so when a student sees it, you can see the student view this way. Um, they won't see everything else. They'll only see the modules they've completed already. And, oh, I gotta get rid of that one. Oh, oh well, no. My students have access to that. I'll have to fix that. Um, this was something we did in an earlier workshop and I didn't pay attention to the I fact that it was either. visible. So, um, we'll, we'll just have so to change that quick, and we can fix that by going into, uh, into content and scrolling down to that demo at the very end. And I think, ooh, there's three things. In, well, those oh, are things we created, demos. I hope. Yeah. Um, this should open it up. 
and we should be able to just go here, scroll all the way to the bottom and delete the module. Don't do that, by the way. The top one would just remove remove the module and the structure, but leave anything that was created. The bottom option will delete any files that you had in there so they're not cluttering up your directory. So yeah. if you really want to get rid of everything in that, and this was yeah. stuff we created in the last couple hours, yeah, so we'll, we'll do that. It. And we that way, it. any of my students will be a little bit less confused when they <laughs> enter the course. But what I was trying to show there is, <laughs> and it was kind of good I did, is that you know, the current module will always be on the top if you put it in reverse order and you have them open week by week. If you're going to have them all available when the course starts, you probably want to do it in a linear fashion. So it goes from one to whatever the, the last module is. Yeah, whatever, whatever way you think is going to be best for your course, um, you know, in terms of structuring, that is, is good. Um, but yeah, so that's how you put a discussion you know, um, topic or discussion forum into your content um, into a module. So, um, Kathy, you mm -hmm. um, have a question, go for it. Um, not a question, just a comment. So um, I do like the idea that John said about having the most current one on top, but definitely do the reverse order because there's nothing more confusing for students to see than seeing modules content being moved around, right? So if it was, if you started one, two, three, four, right? And then all of a sudden you move it someplace else, you know, so things are out of order, it gets confusing. So just be consistent in the yeah, way that yeah, you're presenting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, took an, I took some courses in, from Buff State and sadly, these were from adult ed and they were, they were instructional designers and my advisor did this, she had, a, they use Blackboard, right? She had a current, um, the, in the content area was the current, you know, module. And then she had another sidebar that had all the past modules. So it was just like, you always had to look to see where things were. You wanna make things easy for students to find and consistent, that's all. Doing it linearly from first to last, or if you're going to do weekly releases of content or module by module releases, depending on how many modules you have, the reverse order does make some sense, I think, because that way they're not getting cluttered up with trying to keep track of which weeks are active or not. You know, in this way, as soon as one module ends, the next one appears right at the top, um, as long as I get it ready in time for release. And so far, I have. I think I got it ready at least a half an hour before it opened uh, for this one. Um, but that's there was CIT last week, and I was kind of busy. Any questions or thoughts on discussions? Do you want to show the journal? Oh, yeah, we were going to talk about journals. OK, um, so let's get out of the student view. Um, and just click on your name and hit the X. The X. But well, we're going to go into the other course um, just because I don't want to add sure. groups for the course that's currently active. Uh, well, there is something in chat. Um, yeah, you could include the open closed dates within the module top title, and I have often done that. Um, I didn't do it this time, partly because the calendar is showing up for students right when they connect into the course, and it will give them reminders of what's due that week, what's coming up, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and because when you use a calendar, those dates are in the timeline for students. And when you, if you want to use the same structure, you could. The date manager in here is cleaner than it is in Blackboard. It worked pretty well in Blackboard too, but you just move everything ahead the appropriate number of days to align with the next year's calendar, and only adjust those modules that run into holiday breaks or other things, and everything else gets ported over without you having to manually update as much. Although I have generally manually updated things because I have often done it uh, mm -hmm. that way. Um, okay, but we wanted to go to a different course. So yeah, I'm so going to go back over to here. Yeah, clicking on that Oswego will bring you back to all of your, your courses, main menu. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so you can select a particular semester. So well, we can go back, we can go back into the same one. Um, basically, what you would do is you would first define groups and we go to course tools again. 
course admin, where you go for everything. Get used to course tools to course admin. I know some other campuses have actually dis disabled the rest of the menu uh, and just taken you directly to here, in part because all these other things are there. But, but again, it's all there. These are, this is a quick way to get to other things. But if you go to course admin, it'll take you right to this page, right to this page immediately. Um, with all these students using a library today, it's just a little slow, I guess. Um, and then what you would do is you would go down to groups under learner management. And you would choose a new category and let's say that, let's call this journal um, or whatever you want. I don't think it will show up for students. I haven't tried this, but, um, but you can call it a journal category, put it in. Um, here you put the number of groups um, and what you can do and what you have to do if you want a journal is just create a single user member specific group. And you don't want any restrictions on it. You could own, well, I guess you could put only the students in this class. I don't think it's gonna matter, yeah. but it is required. So you do have to choose that, I guess. Um, there could be advanced properties. Um, and then, well, you can set up other things in there. Well, let's say, let's set up discussion areas. I haven't actually done this yet, but um, we could do the discussion forms as a introductions where it's a journal and then we would create, well, let's create a new topic. Um, and let's put, let's call this introduction, uh, introduction for your professor, let's say, um, or something like that. Yeah. Um, so if you want to do a journal or, or, well, let's say, um, let's call this your journal. <laughs> How's that? Uh, that'll be the discussion forum. Um, and then you'd have some description asking for weekly reflections on their learning or maybe daily or, you know, a few, whatever the specifications are. So uh, reflect on your learning and we'll just leave it like that. Uh, and we'll click save. And that now is a new discussion. And then you could assign weekly versions of this if you'd like. Um, and you would, um, that's the form. You'd then create a new topic um, here, oh, you can't be more than 40 characters. Okay, um, where did that come from? Um, let's go back to what I did. Um, well, I think I asked it, well. So category name was journal. And description shouldn't matter. But did it, did it pick, it shouldn't be asking for the number of groups. Something went wrong here. Let's well, try that again. If you, if you scroll down, right, and select the auto enrollment, or scroll up one more. Oh, that's where you I'm sorry. Do the okay, user. it reset that. Okay, right. there we go. Um, and now it will not ask for the number of right. groups. Okay, um, and we can just click set up discussion areas. Um, there. That's where the error came in, wasn't it? Category. The limit was. Yeah, I don't think we have 40 characters, but. Um, prefix. This may be this may be an issue because it's doing it from the the course title. Maybe mm -hmm. this will get fixed. <laughs> yeah, you can assign students manually to groups. Yeah. Um, you could do it randomly, do it manually, or using some criteria. You could even do it using, with the intelligent agents, you can do it based on the scores or any number of other criteria. Um, but I have no idea why that's wrong. Yeah, that's good enough, that's an error, but maybe my, you scroll down. My guess is the prefix is probably this long title. Yeah. And because it's putting that on it, and then it's probably putting in the student's name or something similar. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, 
my guess is this is probably a design issue. This is new for everybody. Uh, okay. This is not just <laughs> all of cohort one just got in here, but in principle, that's what you would do. <clears throat> and the nice thing about, <clears throat> sorry, about the group settings is that once you create the discussion topic, it automatically populates all the groups. Mm -hmm. And then you just go in and you grade all those in a quick eval <clears throat> and you can give, sorry, my throat got dry. You can give students individual feedback and so forth on their learning and grade them and so forth. Um, I think what would probably, you know, circumvent that is if you, you know, knew you had 30 students, so then you was, you made 30 groups and you assigned one student to each group as opposed to doing the, but that would have, you'd have to do that manually. It's 30 times as much work right. as doing this. <laughs> so and this will be, if, yeah. There's nothing that we did that created in there right, that created that was, a prefix longer. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's just in the setting. And I suspect it's because of the really long course name. Yeah, uh, I suspect. That, that, that seems. There may be a workaround by choosing a group name. You may be able to define. If you yeah, define your own groups. Like group one, group two, yeah. group three, but that's just really that's tedious. That's work. But if you are, you know, if you're, if you use journals a lot, you know, you define those groups once, and then um, you can use them, you know, throughout your um, discussion forums and topics to, um, you know, that is going on week to week. So if you use it in a very regular way. Um, only have to do it once. Let me try it in the development course version of the course that's running right now. We're going to go to groups and let's just see if this is the same problem. A new category and let's just call this test because uh, we're just testing it here. Um, the number of groups here is going to be single user member specific groups. And Okay, we want to select this. The forum will be, we can call it a bulletin board, uh, and that's fine. Create a new topic, and let's see if this works. Okay. So it did work. So there. it did work. It may have something to do with the size of that class. I don't know how many people are in it now, but it, yeah. the capacity is about 400, but I, I don't think there's that many in it right now. So you'd want to create one topic per group? Um, if with threads separated oh, by yeah, groups. Yeah. So you do, if you broke the class up into five groups and you wanted each class to discuss something, let's say if you were doing some type of a virtual, um, what is that, the, the puzzle thing? Um, the group activity, the um, 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 where each person learns about something and they present it to the other people. Mm -hmm. I, a jigsaw. If you wanted oh, yeah. to do a jigsaw, you could assign people to groups, have them discuss it in the group, put together a presentation. Then you could have another set of groups where they'd be explaining. One person from each of those categories would go into other groups and then explain it. That would be what you'd use one topic per group for right. in the first level. But you want one topic with a different thread for each group, which in this case would just be you and that student. So they'd only be sharing their reflections with you. And then you'd give them directions on what to do. And then we would click um, create and then next. And there we go. We created one forum topic, which is just a bulletin board where they get to post bulletins, I guess, about themselves. But, but it does work. And I don't know why that's an issue with the fall course. Yeah. No, but or maybe because there are no students in it. I don't know if there are students. There, in it. There's students in it, John. I wrote this down and I'll look into it. Yeah. Thanks. You know, it's only if you're going to use journal, and I suspect many of us don't. You know, another thing you could do if this is a bug, although it seems to be working here, but if this is a bug, an alternative is just to use an assignment where you let students right. upload, so you know, a, a word file or a upload some text or whatever. So there'll be workarounds. For most most discussion forums, everything seems to be working really cleanly. Mm -hmm. I have no idea exactly why that happened unless it was a length of the name. Yeah. Questions that hopefully we can answer? 
or at least raise questions that Kathy can take right. back to the SUNY people who are managing this. Found it very intuitive. You know, there's there's a bit of a startup cost in making things look nicer in Brightspace. Brightspace has a really nice, clean, intuitive interface, and Blackboard stuff comes over looking like Blackboard crap. Um, you know, but if you remove a lot of the ugly formatting, you can make it look much nicer and match everything else. So, John, this is Sandy. I have a question. John, this is Sandy Bargainer. I have a question. Go for it. Um, so why is all this, like, what I've learned today is everything that's going to get migrated over from Blackboard looks doesn't look great, has to be reformatted, has to be cut and pasted. It has, doesn't so, have to be. <laughs> it doesn't well, have to be. Well, to, do, to get the best we can out of Brightspace. So I, part of me is like, why are we doing that? <laughs> then why, like, I mean, I just spent a lot of time doing all my dates and stuff and changing everything in my fall blackboard so it could migrate, you know, seamlessly, supposedly. Now, we'll all come over. now, now it sounds like I got to go in and change everything anyway. So, so Sandy, well, you know, Sandy, the main things you need to that it's recommended you change is just to make sure the font matches everything else. And you can go into the edit HTML, type control A or the one of the Apple keys, whatever, command A, and that will select all the text. Just go up to the format box, change it, the font to Lato, and change the point, the number of points to 19, and it will come over and it will look really nice. If you have any images in there, you may just want to scale it so it matches the scaling of the text. That's really what the main type of cleanup you have to do, unless you want to reduce a layer sort of hierarchy so you don't right. use sub modules, which again are not generally recommended. And all that involves is dragging them up. All the content comes over and the cleanup really isn't that, it's not as bad as it sounds, you know. Okay, thank you. So, Sandy, I also wanted to chime in. Um, you know, we are doing this at warp speed, right? Oh, I so know, we, I know. We made decisions. Um, and one of the decisions was, was to have faculty copy their content into their fall Blackboard course shell. We created them um, for that and to clean up. One of the reasons was, was because there is a file limit size and there were some faculty that had really big files and we're also doing at the same time. Yeah, well, yours- We got it fixed, it was easy. <laughs> yeah, um, there, yours is nothing compared to some. Yeah. Um, but there was, um, we're also doing the video thing at the same time, right? We're, the ensemble's going away and we're making sure that people who have been uploading videos directly to Blackboard are resolving that. We will not do that for the spring. I already made the decision um, because there will still be, like John said, the formatting and stuff that you're gonna wanna do when you get to Brightspace to have it look nice and pretty. Um, but then also is an absolute nightmare for me. <laughs> this has been very labor intensive. So we're learning. I mean, everybody's learning as we go. Yeah. Uh, I thank you all because I can't. Imagine. And I know the SUNY thank people you. who were working with Brightspace had asked if it was possible to change it to clean up some of the formatting, but that didn't seem to work. Um, for whatever reason, this is something just a feature of Brightspace that the default fonts for some of their the pages do not, or the default font size does not match their style sheets. And it would logically, one would think that the conversion process they built could do that, but it doesn't. But again, it's just once for each file changing the font size. And it, it's, you know, it's yeah. not like you have to rewrite everything. Right, <laughs> and I guess, you know, I would pick and choose, you know, I, I don't think you'd, you know, if it's too much to convert all of your materials into those templates, then just, you know, select the font and change the font, you know, kind of decide what's, um, 
you know, what, what you have time for and um, what makes the most sense for your course. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, you know, we certainly are happy to answer anything, um, you know, or pass along any questions that you might have. So definitely reach out. Um, and thank you for joining us. And if you get stuck on anything serious, contact help at oswego.edu and one of the instructional designers, Kathy, will work with you to help resolve the problem. But we're happy to consult with, with the basic stuff. Yeah. And these are all things we've learned in the last few weeks, basically. So. Yeah, and they'll be holding office hours um, starting that's tomorrow right. in the afternoons. Um, so as you are preparing your courses, um, that's definitely a, a good asset to you know, drop in and ask questions as you're doing this. Yeah, and just to um, plug, starting next um, week on Wednesday the 15th, um, we're going to be having migration of munchies in the library, room 215. Um, and this, the, somebody from the support staff, the DLE support staff will be there on Wednesdays is from one to four and Thursdays is 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So you can just drop in, bring your laptop. Um, if you don't have a laptop, you can get one from the library and work on your courses together. Um, the provost is providing um, the munchies and we are providing the M&Ms because it's migration and munchies. So M&Ms, everybody will get a little fun sized thing of M&Ms. And if That's anyone enticing. wants some tea to take up there, you're welcome to grab some on your way up and we don't have M&M, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.